Welcome to Alaska Edition, a weekly public affairs program produced by Alaska Public Media in the studios of KAKM. Hello, I'm your host, Ann Hillman. For the past two weeks, we've been talking about the Arctic. President Obama visited the state earlier this month to highlight issues like climate change and our country's role in developing Arctic policy. Last week, we spoke with some scientists from the University of Alaska Anchorage about their research and how the White House is using science to shape policy. So this week, I want to take a step back and talk about what exactly is Arctic policy, who determines it, who implements it, and what does it mean for Alaskans? My guests today are Nils Andreessen. He's the executive director of the Institute of the North. Welcome to the show. And Craig Fleener, the Arctic policy advisor to Governor Walker and a former representative of the Gwich'in Council to the Arctic Council. Thank you both very much for being here. So let's just jump straight to it. This is a primer on Arctic policy. What in the world is Arctic policy really mean? Nils. I have to answer first. Um, so I, I think that you know an easy way to think of Arctic policy is the decisions that a nation um, or a, you know, a, a policymaker will make um, that uh, impact how resources are allocated um, or regulations implemented uh, affecting people's lives in, uh, in the business community. That's one way to think about it. Yeah, that's, that's a, a good definition. I think I would add that Arctic policy is anything that our policymakers determine it's going to be. And if you consider that Alaska is the only reason that the U.S. is an Arctic nation, then I would say that nearly everything that Alaska does has some nexus to Arctic policy. So either we are making policies that are going to have an impact on the Arctic or something in the Arctic is going to have an impact to all Alaskans in one way, shape, or form. So nearly everything that uh, you could imagine can be considered Arctic policy if it, if it has a direct nexus to impacting people and, and resources in the state of Alaska. Yeah. And policymakers, I think we both said, so that would be um, really state or federal um, or congressional delegations, uh, legislators who are making policy. It would be administrations, uh, either the governors, for instance, or uh, the White House administration. Uh, I think often federal agencies uh, will they implement uh, a policy, um, but they've got some latitude there to to affect how things and decisions that are made uh, at the state level. It's important to, to note that from an Arctic perspective, the Arctic Council, not a policy-making body, and the people who are there representing individual nations aren't policy-makers. But there is an important thing to, to bring up, and that is the, the role of indigenous people in the North and uh, the fact that uh, there are 229 tribes in Alaska, and a lot of them are, are heavily involved, heavily invested in Arctic policy, especially the folks that are feeling the impacts of, of climate change or change in, changing resource patterns, uh, the, the ability to, to develop resources. And so they're very interested in Arctic policy and, and involved in Arctic policy in Alaska. But even beyond that, they have a very active and strong role in the Arctic Council and helping to shape the decisions that, uh, that are made by the Arctic Council. Okay, so I've taken away two major things from this conversation thus far. One, anything can be Arctic policy as long as it has to do with the Arctic, which is pretty broad. Yes. Um, and then two, the Arctic Council isn't actually a policy-making body. What if there is one message from the next two years that we kind of bring to Alaskans, it's that. <laughs> okay. Uh, so. um, I think. Uh, I, mean, I think it's, it's so important that... Uh, um, we recognize that the Arctic Council, a consensus-based forum for discussion and intergovernmental cooperation, doesn't make, uh, doesn't decide how resources are allocated, and doesn't uh, interfere with or direct an individual nation's or tribes or states' uh, decision-making uh, ability. And a good way to understand that really is that the U.S. State Department is the body that represents the United States at the Arctic Council, and they're not a domestic organization, right. so they can't really impact or influence domestic policy in Alaska or in the U.S. Now, of course, they can be involved, they can give advice, they can, uh, they can guide and advise, and they've done that very thing. In, in the two-year plan for the U.S. chairmanship of the Arctic Council, they've laid out what they want to work on, but they're not actually going to be conducting that work. They hand that off to the agencies that actually do have authority in the U.S. So they will hand off responsibilities and uh, assignments to the Department of Interior, Department of Energy, 
other departments like that, and they carry that work out because they are the pol they can then uh, assist in policy making. Okay. All right. This is what we're going to do. So wait, you've got more. Tell me more. <laughs> <laughs> Whose program is this? Um, <laughs> So, I mean, I, I think that for Alaskans to understand if the Arctic Council's not the decision-making or policy-making body, then and the question would be who is. And I think then it's the, the federal agencies, and there's a national strategy for the Arctic region uh, that's developed by the White House and the 20 or so federal agencies that have equities in the Arctic region, some am amount of responsibility uh, for Arctic decision-making. And they put together and implement the national strategy for the Arctic region. Um, and that's where Alaskans should be focused on, because that's where you'll see investments made, potentially, or decisions made that change how things currently are structured. And that's really important. The, the important point there is Alaskans have to get involved. We have to step forward, or the decisions are all going to be made for us on, on our behalf by someone else, typically from Washington, D.C. or somewhere else. So. If we are interested in, in Arctic policy and in guiding the discussion about Arctic policy, we have to make sure that we're involved in every, in every step along the way. And so we, we can't do that if we leave it up to the 20 agencies or so that, that Nils referenced. We have to step forward and, and advise and guide on what Arctic policy should be. And uh, the legislature did that very thing. And uh, when they developed the, the Alaska Arctic Policy Commission document, the, the document that was actually signed into law by the governor, that has become the Arctic policy for Alaska. And those are the, uh, the, the components in there are what we're actually carrying out. OK. How are we going to do this? So this is what we're going to do okay. right now. We are going to take a step back, and we're going to show a quick video that explains Arctic Council. Arctic Council. So that okay. everyone, know, because we keep talking about this and we're the chairmen of the Arctic Council and this is a great thing. Who in the world is the Arctic Council? Who gets to be involved? So we'll talk about that. Okay. Then we'll talk about how you used to be involved, Craig, when you were representing the, uh, the Gwich'in Council. Gwich'in Council International, mm -hmm. yes. And then if there, let's just start with that. Perfect. See so here we go. All right, let's roll the tape. <laughs> It is Alaska that makes the U.S. an Arctic nation, and this is a big year for Alaska and Arctic-y type stuff in general since the U.S. assumed chairmanship of the Arctic Council earlier this year. Arctic Council, what exactly is that, you say? That's a really good question. For starters, the Arctic Council is one of literally dozens of governmental policy-tilted Arctic discussion groups. How confusing, we know. But arguably, it's the Arctic Forum with the most chutzpah. Only states with a foothold in the Arctic, in the literal sense, can be members of the Arctic Council. There are eight of them, Canada, Finland, Iceland, Norway, Denmark, which represents Greenland, Russia, Sweden, and the good old red, white, and blue, the United States. Non-Arctic nations can also have a voice on the Arctic Council, albeit a much smaller one. Those nations are called permanent observers, and there are lots of them. There's a process to becoming a permanent observer, but we're not going to get into that right now. Also on the council are six groups that represent the interests of the indigenous peoples of the north. In Arctic Council lingo, these groups are called permanent participants. Neither the permanent participants nor the permanent observers have decision-making power. That falls solely to the council's eight member states. So what does it mean that the U.S. is the council's chair? Well, there are a lot of boring parts to that, like the U.S. has to do all the administrative aspects of the council, things like organizing meetings, distributing reports, etc. But as the chair, the U.S. also gets to largely set the tone and direction of Arctic Council summits. It's using its two years in the spotlight to make headway on three declared objectives, improving the well-being of Arctic communities, bolstering marine stewardship in the Arctic Ocean, and addressing the impacts of climate change. Phew, that's a tall order. The exciting part for Alaska in all this hoopla is the chance to be the landing spot for some of these big meetings. Over the next two years, meetings for the Arctic Council bigwigs are scheduled in Anchorage, Barrow, Fairbanks, Unalaska, Kotzebue, Juneau, and China Hot Springs. Yowzers! At the end of all these meetings and talks and collaborative efforts, the torch will get passed yet again to the next council member in queue, Finland. Okay. A decent summary? It was mostly right. Yeah, it was pretty good. Oh. <laughs> I'm questioning whether or not you should be a guest again. <laughs> I'm just teasing. I'm just Failing. Teasing. <laughs> all right. So we know what the Arctic Council is. We have all of these different people who participate in it. You were at one point a permanent participant. What does that mean you did, Craig? Well, so a permanent participant actually has a, an even greater role than I think the video pointed out, and that is the ability to speak at any time during the, the discourse 
by the council the ability to be involved in the working groups, the ability to contribute authorship and uh, research. Uh, probably the most important point is being around the big round table with everybody else and every single opportunity there is to offer any kind of words of advice or direction, guidance, they're allowed to do that. As a matter of fact, I would say most of the decisions, which are consensus-based, as Nils pointed out, most of those decisions don't advance unless they have the permanent participant thumbs up on it. So it isn't uh, mandatory, but I think that it's, it's gauged as very important, and that, that's a tremendous opportunity. It means that the people who actually live in the Arctic, and for the United States this is really important because the decision makers that participate in the Arctic Council are mostly from the lower 48. So it's really important that we have our indigenous voice there to help to guide the discussion about what's going on in the Arctic and what impacts us, the decisions that are going to be made and, and how we're going to feel those once those decisions are made. In Canada it's the same way, in Russia and in Greenland, maybe not so much in the Scandinavian countries because there's so much of their population does live in the north. But for us, uh, the other four nations, I think it's really important that the permanent participants are there. And I felt that when I was there. It was a, a co very collaborative effort. We had uh, great access to all of the decision making and uh, while we didn't always get our way, I think it was it, it was a good opportunity to try to get your way, to to try to convince the uh, the eight nations on, on the direction that they should go, and uh, and there were plenty of opportunities to do that. Yeah. So, you guys have mentioned in various forms that they're not a policy making body. So they produce all these papers, they have all these working groups, they have all these conversations. What are those used for? Yeah, so they don't necessarily. I mean, it's a, an Arctic Council stamp that goes on these reports. But under, and I think Craig's point that the, there's a very a vast difference between permanent participants and perm observers. And observers are broken into nations and, and organizations. But permanent participants have a, a seat at the table at the same table that Secretary Kerry does. Mm -hmm. um, so that's uh, incredible um, in, in their approach to, to how they want to approach the Arctic, um, that rights holders are really around the table. The work that happens within the Arctic Council is carried out through working groups and task forces. Six working groups, two or three task forces currently, um, and most of those are led by other agency uh, staff. Um, so, for instance, the Protection of the Arctic Marine Environment Working Group uh, is led by NOAA. Um, so the work that's getting carried out within each of these um, working groups is carried out by federal or, or other agencies, um, some state officials, university, um, you know, researchers, not only within the U.S. but in, in all the eight Arctic nations. Permanent participants contribute subject matter experts to those. So it's actually a much broader and more complicated, complex uh, group that's involved in producing things on behalf of or under the auspices of the Arctic Council. Well, and while the Arctic Council meetings themselves are closed to just the, the membership that we talked about, the, the actual meetings themselves, the working groups are much more open. And as a university researcher or a government researcher, an indigenous person, uh, there are lots of opportunities. They're always looking for opportunities to bring in experts to contribute in all of the different working groups. And so that's a really wonderful place to participate. And those documents, uh, they then help guide policy making. So the, the CAF working group, the Conservation of Arctic Flora and Fauna, in partnership with another working group, I forget, uh, created a document called the Arctic Climate Impact Assessment, uh, a very rich document that looked at climate change and, uh, and impacts to people, impacts to wildlife, et cetera. And that document is still being used today to, to help guide and shape uh, direction for agencies and, and individuals. So you could say that the Arctic Council is a great, like an organized way for people to collaborate and bring all these ideas together and get them out to the mm -hmm. actual policymakers. Intergovernmental forum, which is why it's different than all those other logos that were on the screen. Mm -hmm. um, it's actually governments and rights holders that are around the table. They're a convener. Um, they're bringing subject matter experts from their nations together to share best practices, identify research gaps, mm -hmm. and work to address them. So they don't set policy, but I think I always think of it as trickle-down policy because then you've got basically a, a best practice that the Arctic Council's identified and it's up to an individual nation to decide how it implements this be best practice. 
Okay. And it's it's a lot of fun really when you when you have the switch over of the chairmanships because you go from one country having some level of autonomy, although they it is consensus based, but the 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 guiding of uh, of the next two years is determined by that nation. It's presented to the Arctic Council, and and then they all give it the thumbs up if they agree. But there's that level of autonomy to go forward and present whatever case you think is important for the Arctic. Mm -hmm. And so when you when we switched over from Canada to the U.S., the Canadian chairmanship had a bunch of great things going on. Switched over to the U.S., it's it's very different than the Canadian chairmanship. So that's that's a lot of fun, I think, anyways. Mm -hmm. And then when it switches over to the next country, it'll once again have a, a flavor for for Finland or a Scandinavian flavor mm -hmm. and typically the I think the uh, the countries that are leading at the time will try to partner with the country before it and the country after it to have some longevity in their projects so fin Finland for example would it would be wise for them to work with the US and then with the country that that takes over after them uh, so they have a little bit of long more longevity in, in their mm -hmm. their projects so I think that's a, a really interesting uh, part of the Arctic Council that doesn't really get talked about very much yeah. and those themes then chair from chairmanship to chairmanship the work of the working groups continue. So they have their individual work plans that will continue projects, you know, based, you know, five, ten years ago even, uh, depending on the length of the project. So you see continuity at that level. Um, the chair gets to decide kind of their major themes um, that are consensus. I mean, they have to be approved by the other nations. They can identify projects that are often carried out by the Sustainable Development Working Group for instance, because that's one of the uh, working groups that they have most control over. Um, but uh, it's can, complicated. I mean, can you guys give me an example of how something the Arctic Council has done has impacted an everyday Alaskan? Craig can. Well, I think the <laughs> Arctic Marine Shipping Assessment and uh, uh, us taking a look at shipping lanes uh, us taking a look at the potential for pollution, where we should, uh, well, back to shipping lanes, where we should route ships, where we should have closed off areas, the idea that we have, that we need to uh, focus on an international code to, uh, to work with shipping as it potentially is going to increase across Alaska, that, that I think will have a huge impact on Alaska. It already has, is having some impact on Alaska, but I think as shipping increases, if it, if it doubles or triples or, or even more as, it, as we suspect it will, then there's going to continue to be uh, a tremendous impact. Probably the greatest impact so far, I think, is the, the Glacier Conference and the, the visit by the President. If, if the U.S. were not chair of the Arctic Council, I, I doubt we would have had that meeting. And I think the timing was probably perfect for that to take place here. And uh, that is a tremendous impact to Alaska because so many Alaskans got the ability to contribute information to uh, highlight what's important to Alaska and, and the fact that we have the President and the Secretary of State and the Secretary of Interior up here now back in DC talking about how great of a trip it was, what's the, the, the important things in Alaska. I think there are tremendous takeaways from that and a lot of people had the ability to provide input on what's important to them and I think there were a lot of uh, a good takeaways for the state. Yeah, and I would just add to that I and mean, there, there have been three agreements that have produ been produced under the auspices of the Arctic Council signed mm -hmm. outside of the Arctic Council but developed under its auspices. Uh, one on search and rescue uh, and one on oil spill response and one on oil pollution prevention. Um, mm -hmm. And each of those um, I think have, have advanced, they haven't committed resources necessarily, but have committed e each of the eight Arctic nations to uh, cooperate on those three areas and um, so have minimal levels of response and, and additional infrastructure in place mm -hmm. and protocols for how they communicate, which I think is really important, especially important for Alaska. I would also say that under the Arctic Council, I think it's been something of a, um, you know, it's cultivated concepts like ecosystem-based management or advanced concepts like marine protected areas, um, which will have fairly significant impacts to Alaska as or if they're implemented. And, and I think the trend is toward implementing both. Um, at the same time, in and around the development of the national strategy for the Arctic region, this concept of integrated Arctic management, kind of a, a comprehensive, more holistic approach from a federal agency side of thing, or the 20, um, at how they approach the Arctic, I think that's reflected in a lot of the Arctic Council work too, and uh, is one of the reasons that they're thinking about a more integrated approach is because they've got all these different levels of governance, 
um, and decision making going on that they have to really get, get their hands around. Well, and the, just the highlighting of Alaska and the highlighting of the Arctic and the fact that it is front and center in, in a lot of discussions now, I think, is, is tremendously impactful for Alaska. Uh, if it was not that way, if we were not talking about the Arctic, if the president hadn't come, if Glacier didn't take place, if we weren't uh, the chair, then it would be Alaskans talking about this issue and not the rest of the country. So Alaskans are benefiting tremendously from from the highlighting that's taking place now. And uh, we're thinking about the future of the Arctic, how we, we see the Arctic Ocean being governed, how we mm -hmm. see the Bering Sea being managed, what are we going to do about, uh, about new species of fisheries and marine mammals that may be coming into Arctic waters. These are big changes that uh, we are very are going to experience in our lifetime and and so the ability to have input now before uh, negative impacts happen I think is tremendous for Alaska. So ultimately who makes decisions about things like who owns the Arctic? I know that Russia, the Russian Federation is asking the UN that they want to have control over more of the Arctic. So like, they're, because they're supposed to, and that's the, <laughs> the rules of the road. Yeah. Uh, so that's the United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea, um, which the eight Arctic nations are signed on to except for the U.S. Why? And under politics, um, okay. um, for a couple <laughs> reasons, and, and we could probably talk more about them. Um, but UNCLOS really sets out how Arctic nations should approach um, their sovereignty in the Arctic. claims. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And so under that, they've, and there's a, a whole timeline for each nation to, should do its research, figure out what, it, what its territorial claim looks like, and submit that to the UN. So it's not like Russia's doing this unilaterally. Yeah. They're doing it because actually we've got protocols in place that say, everybody should do this. And Russia isn't the only one making claims. Right. Pretty much everybody except the U.S. is making claims. Even though we're quietly making our own claims, I think uh, I think most of the other countries are doing that as well. What do you mean we're quietly making our own claims? Well, we're not a, a signatory to the Law of the Sea Treaty, so mm -hmm. we can't make that petition to to the U.N. So we, we of course, have an understanding of what we think is uh, the expansion, what we should have as the expansion of, of our territorial claims, just like the other countries do. And I think federal agencies have proceeded as if we were signatories, and they've done the research necessary and done the mapping mm -hmm. um, that all the other nations have done. And I think they want to be prepared to submit something in and if and when. Yeah, we, we just don't have that mechanism at our yeah. fingertips yet. Yeah. So what mechanism was used? Because you mentioned that the United States did agree to, ha to have things like oil spill response in place and search and rescue in place. That's Is that just a country to country? It's a, yeah, it's a eight nation yep. um, uh, agreement framework treaty almost. Outside of the United yeah. Nations, yeah. Okay. Yeah, the, one of the really important parts of the uh, components of the Arctic Council is that they have decided that they want the Arctic Ocean to be free and to, to be uh, open and uh, not to have a, a strong hand of governance upon it, but to be managed well and, and through consensus. So I think that, that is, that's an important thing to know about the Arctic Council is, is they want the Arctic to be free and safe and, and managed that way. And uh, I, so, think, so I think that has set the path for, for how we discuss what's going to happen in the future in the Arctic, uh, in the Arctic Ocean. So that would mean that things like if there was a viable commercial fishery quotas will be set by international consensus. I think that is the case. Uh, very much outside of the Arctic Council. Yes, yeah. that, that is definitely not the Arctic Council. Yeah. So there's two things that the Arctic Council won't address, fisheries and defense. So also important to know. What yeah. about, what about like drilling and other resources? Um, well, they don't make economic or commercial decisions at all. Mm -hmm. Uh, but a lot of that, I think, would come under Sustainable Development Working Group as an economic thread. And with the creation of the Arctic Economic Council, I think they've anticipated that industry needs to be more involved in the, the policy making discussion, policy shaping discussions. But as Neil said, they won't be making those decisions. They'll be, they'll be conducting research. Mm -hmm. They'll be uh, looking for consensus. They'll be looking for partnership opportunities like with search and rescue. Yeah. And they can do that bilaterally mm -hmm. or, or through the Arctic Council. And, and they 
won't have the ability to bind uh, each nation to, to certain activities. But if, if all of the nations are sitting around the table saying it's smart for us to work together on search and rescue, then it makes perfect sense for us to do that. Yeah. And search and rescue and, and oil spill response crosses borders mm -hmm. in a way that drilling or you know, drilling would be up to an individual nation to decide how it leases or mm -hmm. approaches its regulatory framework. Uh, shipping uh, often proceeding in international waters, so outside a, a jurisdiction mm -hmm. of a nation. So not up to uh, the Arctic Council. So to bring things down a couple more levels, does the state have an Arctic policy? Well, the state, yes, the state, I mean, the, it's what I mentioned earlier, the, the legislature passed the uh, Alaska Arctic Policy Commission document, which was signed into law. That, that basically is our policy. Now, we, we haven't refined it down into bite-sized morsels. It, it is the entire document. And initially, when I took the position of Arctic Policy Advisor, I, I actually thought that I would work to refine that to something that was a little bit easier for folks to tangibly look at. But uh, I think the there is so much going on right now that I've turned my focus to outreach and Arctic Council activities instead of uh, a refined report. Yeah. All right. Well, that is... Three things for Alaskans to pay attention to. Working group efforts of the Arctic Council, national strategy for the Arctic region, and the state's Arctic policy and implementation plan. If you plan. have questions or comments about the program, you can email Alaska Edition at alaskapublic.org or write us at 3877 University Drive, Anchorage, Alaska, 99508. Alaska Edition is a production of KAKM. The opinions expressed are those of the hosts and guests and do not necessarily represent those of KSKA, KAKM, the licensee, or their underwriter.